Hey guys, my name is Tensor. Today we're going to be looking at testing and test-driven development in Rust, and we'll also touch on error handling and a few other concepts. From a very basic point of view, tests allow us to test to see if our code is functioning in an expected manner. And in Rust, we build test functions to do this. The bodies of these test functions typically perform some kind of setup, and then they run the code that we want to test. They assert or panic if they fail. Now with test-driven development, you start with your tests and then you build out your code to match the tests. So you have some kind of expected behavior that you want to achieve with your code. You build out your tests to show that expected behavior and then you build out your code to make your tests all pass. Now because we're just going to be doing a very basic introduction into these concepts, the application that we're going to be building is going to be pretty incidental. All I want to do is create an application that reads from a file and that file will have a series of numbers. So it'll read in all of these numbers as a string. Then it will take that string, split it up into a vector of numbers. Then it will add all of these numbers together and then write all of the numbers back into the file with the sum appended to the numbers. All right, so I'm going to write down these four steps. That way we can build functions for each of these steps and we can build tests to test each of these steps. I've also created two folders, one called data and the other one called test data. Data will be where our numbers.txt file is and this is where we'll put our numbers. And then we'll also have two test files that we can use for our tests. In Rust, most unit tests go into a test submodule inside of the file where you're going to test the code. So in this case, all of our code is going to reside in our main.rs file. And so I've created a submodule here called test. And because we've got this CFG proc macro, we can assure that even though we're adding a bunch of code to the main.rs file, it will not get compiled when we go to compile our application for production. So this submodule only gets compiled when we run our tests. Now, of course, because it's a submodule, we need to expose the scope of our parent module. So we can use super and then a glob import, and this will import all of the code outside of the submodule. Now, before we go any further, I want to set up a custom result and error type. And the reason I want to do this is so that we can maintain the various different errors that we're going to get. So if we consider the various different operations that we're going to perform with our application, we're going to be reading and writing to a file. So we'll have IO errors and we'll even have typos and stuff like that. We want to be able to handle all these errors with a singular error type and a singular result type. Now in Rust, the error type is just a trait. And of course, traits are not structs and they do not have a fixed size at compile time. So Rust will not compile if it doesn't know the size of a data type at compile time. And we can get around this by taking the error type and putting it inside of a box because the box represents a pointer and we know the size of this pointer at compile time. So even if we are working with a bunch of different error types that implement the error trait that have various different sizes, the Rust compiler can use the box as a means of basically saying, all right, well, they're at least this large. Now we can go ahead and just type alias the result type onto our T result here because all of the errors that we're going to be passing into this result will be a T error. We only need a single generic for this result. So the result will return whatever this generic type is, and then the error type will be a T error type, which is just a box with a dynamically dispatched error trait inside of it. All right, so now let's go ahead and create a skeleton function called read file. It'll take in a reference to a slice of string, and then it will return a T result with a string in it. We can use the unimplemented macro to get rid of any potential errors. So even though this function is not actually returning a result and it's not actually doing anything, we can use the unimplemented macro as a means of getting rid of any potential errors. This way this function acts as a placeholder. 
All right, so now down in our test submodule, we can go ahead and create a test function called test read file, which will take our read file function and test it. In this test, we can call to our read file function and pass in a path that we want to read. So we're going to read from our test data folder and we're going to read this test1.txt file. This is going to give us back a result of string type, remember. So we can then take this result and check to see if that result is an OK type, meaning it's coming back with the string and it's not failing. We can use the assert macro is OK returns a boolean. If the assert macro gets false, then it will panic. The test will then fail because it panics. Otherwise, if true gets passed into the assert macro, then it does not panic and the test passes. In Visual Studio Code with the RLS plugin, I can just click this run test subscript and it will go ahead and run the test inside of the terminal. We did in fact get a failure because our function hasn't been implemented yet. Let's go ahead and implement the function. I'm going to import read to string and we'll put this in our function. This allows us to read it from a file and read it as a string and it returns a result. And I'm also going to import write. So we can just pass in a string representation of our path and then it will read in the file at that path as a string. Now also notice that I'm calling map error and this is taking in a closure. And what it's doing is it's just taking the error from the result type, this IO result, and it's then converting that error into our T error type with this E.into call. Now you can see that our function passes the test. Our function reads the file and it gives us back a result of OK. Now we can go ahead and make sure that this function is also giving us back the correct string data that we are expecting. So let's go ahead and take the string inside of the result and unwrap it using the if let binding. And then we can pass it to a macro called assert EQ or assert equal. This takes in two values, the first one being our string and then the second one being an empty string and it asserts that these two values are the same. If they come back as the same value, then the assert macro will not panic, but if they come back as different values, then the assert macro will panic. We can go ahead and run our test now and of course our test continues to pass because we have an empty string inside of our test1 file. We can have multiple asserts inside of a single test function and if one of these asserts fails then the entire test function will fail but if both of the asserts or all of the asserts pass then the test function will pass. Let's go into our test1 file and add some data. So I'm going to put in the numbers 3 and 5 and I'm going to put each of them on a new line so that we have a consistent format. So when we read in the values, they'll each be on a new line and then we can go ahead and split them based on this new line character. Now, of course, if we run this test again, it fails and it gives us that it panicked at assertion failed where left equals right, where the left side, that is S, is equal to three backslash R backslash N, five, and then the right side is the empty string that we have here. With Visual Studio Code, we can change the end of line sequence from carriage return line feed to just line feed. And what this will do is it will make it so that this file will only have backslash ends at a new line instead of backslash r backslash n. So our new string will look like this instead of this. Carriage return line feed is something that you'll find on Windows, whereas Linux uses line feed. Now let's go back to our main.rs file and put the correct string into our assert eq macro and go ahead and run the test again. And you can see here that now our test passes. So our function reads from the file and converts the data into a string for us. And it does exactly what we expect it to. Let's now create a function that will allow us to convert that string into a vector of numbers. So again, we can create a skeleton function here. I'm going to call it split numbers. It'll take in a reference to a string and then it will output a T result with a vector of U size inside of it. 
and we can of course put the unimplemented macro inside of it. Now let's go ahead and create a new test function called test split numbers. And this will of course test the function that we just created called split numbers. So we'll call split numbers and we're going to call it with a string from five backslash n eight. And of course this will be a reference to a string. And we can then check to see if the result is okay again, like we did up here. And of course we know this is going to fail. All right, so in our split numbers function, we'll take our string and we can call a method on it called split white space, which will slice the string by white space. So in this case, we're slicing the string at every new line character. Now this gives us back an iterator and we can take that iterator and map on top of it. So we take each of the values and we want to convert them from a string into a u size number. So as we're mapping over each of these strings, we can call x.parse and we want to convert them into u size. So we pass in u size. Then we want to map over each of the errors that we get back from parsing the numbers because this gives us back a result. And we can change those errors into our t error type. And then we can take all of the OK values, that is, all of the u sizes, and just collect them into a vector. And this will return a t result vector u size. So now, of course, if we run our test here, you can see that the test test split numbers has now passed. Now this is an acceptable test, but we want more specificity. So we want to make sure that we're getting back a vector with the appropriate values inside of it. And in this case, it would be a vector with five and eight inside of it. Again, we can go ahead and take our result and unwrap it using the if let destructor. So this will give us back our vector and we can use assert EQ to assert that the vector that we get back from our result is the same as a vector of five and eight. And of course, this will pass if we run it. And what that essentially tells us is that these two functions now have the functionality that we were looking for. So now let's move on to taking the numbers that we got back from our file in the vector format and summing all of them together to get a single number which we can then put back in our file. As we did before, we'll create another skeleton function. This time, however, we're not going to be returning a result type. Instead, we're just going to be taking in a vector of u size type and then returning a single u size number. We can now, of course, go down and create a test for this. And our test is just going to be called test add numbers. We'll go ahead and we'll call add numbers with a vector of three and six. And we then want to assert that the sum that we get back from this call is equal to nine. And as you can see here, we're just using the normal assert macro. So we can use assert EQ, and this is equivalent to just writing sum equals nine because this is a conditional expression that will return a Boolean. If it's true, then the assertion will pass. If it's false, then the assertion will panic. And of course, because our add numbers function is unimplemented at this point, the assertion will fail. Now for this function, I'm going to use a bit of a functional style and we're just going to take our vector. We're going to turn it into an iterator. And then we're going to use a method called fold with a closure inside of it. What fold does is it allows us to take all the values in the vector and then convert them into a single value using some kind of operation. And in this case, our operation is reflected by this closure. Fold also allows us to input a initial value or an accumulator. And in this case, the initial value is the first argument that we're passing into our closure. So our initial value starts at zero and then we take X, which is the first value in the vector. And we want to then add it to this sum value. And then we'll put that sum value back into the closure. And then we'll take the next value in the vector and add it back to the sum value. We can simply implement this by just saying sum equals sum plus X and then returning sum so that it then gets put back into sum again. And this way, 
we'll take all of the numbers in our vector and we'll add all of them together through a single operation. So instead of having to manually go through and iterate through our vector using a for loop or something like that, we can just iterate through the vector and use a single method and a closure to do exactly what we're trying to do. And of course, if we come down to test add numbers and we test it, you can see here that it does indeed pass. When we go ahead and we sum three and six, we get nine and we can then assert that nine equals nine. And of course, if we want to, we can put a lot of different test cases inside of a test function. So here we're adding two numbers together inside of a vector. Then we've got one where we're adding one number. So this vector only has one. It should come back with the sum being one. Then we've got a vector with three numbers in it. And of course, these should all be added up together. So it should give us 13. And then we've got a vector with no numbers in it. And this should come back and return with zero. And if we call these tests, we of course get that this test passes. It can also be useful sometimes to use the final assert macro that's built into the standard library called assert and e or assert not equal. So this allows us to check to see if two values are not the same. And we can check to see if sum one and sum none are not equal, which of course they aren't because one of them should be one and then the other one should be zero. And our test passes successfully. All right, so now we finally have our use size value, and then we have the path of the file that we want to write this sum back into. What we want to do is take the sum and put it at a new line at the end of the file. So we're going to put it after the numbers that we read in. That way we can call our program on the file again, read in all the numbers, get the sum, and put it at the end of the file. So we'll create a function here called write numbers, which we'll take in and then a reference to a sliced string for the path. And then we'll return a T result with a unit type inside of it. Now, because we're going to be writing data into a file, we're going to keep this file separate from the other file that we're reading data from. So that's why we have our two different files. We'll call write numbers with 10 on the path test data test to txt and then of course we can just check to see if the result that we got back is okay so if it's okay then it's just a unit type and if it isn't okay then we have an error of some kind and since our write numbers function is not implemented this test would fail if we ran it all right so we can go ahead and create a new path using our reference to our slice of string using path new and then we can reuse our read file function and for this we can take the path and convert it into a string by calling path display to string this function takes in a reference so we need to make this into a reference and of course because this returns a result we can use the question mark to implicitly throw out the error or rather bubble it up to our t result now the reason why we're reading all of the data from the file is because the write function which we're about to use to write to the file will overwrite all of the data in the file and we want to keep the data in the file and just add the sum to the bottom of the file. So we need to read in all of the data first, and then we can put the new data on the bottom of this string and then put all of that back into the file. So to finish off this function, we'll call that write function that I was talking about. And this takes in a value P, which implements the as ref path trait. And this can just be our path type. And then it also takes in the contents of the file, which in this case is just a formatted string where we're taking the data that we read from the file and we're separating it from the new sum value with a new line character. The write function returns an IO result. So you want to deal with that error and we can do that with a question mark and then we can return OK with a unit type inside of it. All right, so let's go back down to our test. So with our write numbers test, we're just putting 10 into our test data 
test2.txt file. Let's go ahead and put some data into this file so that the 10 makes sense. So we're going to put in 4 and 6, and of course these added together will give us 10. And if we go and run the test, you can see that it does pass because we do get back an OK result. And if we look inside of the file, we can see that we do in fact get back 4, 6, and then 10. Now we want more specificity in this test function. And we can add more specificity by calling our read file function to peek inside of the file and then taking the result of that, unwrapping it from the OK, and then checking to see if it's equal to 4, new line 6, new line 10. Now, of course, we know that if we run this test now, we're going to add a new 10 to the bottom of our file, and this will not pass. And you can see here that it does indeed fail. So S equals 4, new line 6, new line 10, new line 10, whereas our right is 4, new line 6, new line 10. We can make our test more consistent by creating a function inside of our test module, which will set up the test2 text file. So what we're doing here is just calling the write function which writes to our test2 file and we're just going to write to the whole file and make it so that it's just for new line 6. That way every time we run our test the data inside of the file will be consistent. We can now add an execution of this setup test write function inside of our test write numbers function and we can then, of course, add an assert here to make sure that the result came back as OK. That way we can deal with any potential errors. And if it comes back as OK, that means that we've written to the file, and then we can go on with the rest of our tests. So now if we run this test, you can see that it does indeed pass. Now, unfortunately, there's no subscript button that I can push to run all of the tests inside of VS Code. But we can just go into the terminal and just run cargo test, and this will run all of the tests in our application. And we can see here that it tells us that it's running four tests, and that all of the four tests passed with OK. And we can run it multiple times. You can see here that it consistently passes. All right, so now let's go ahead and set up our actual application by setting up our main function. Now notice I've made it so that our main function returns a T result with the unit type inside of it. This is possible because of Rust 2018, and I can also make it so that our tests return a result so that we can deal with any potential errors, but I chose not to do that except for in the case of our setup function. So in our main function, we'll set up our path then we'll call read file on the path, and this will give us back a result. Then we can match on the result. If we get back OK, we can continue, and we'll split the numbers, which will give us our vector. Then we can take the vector, pass it through our add numbers function, which will give us the sum, and then we can call write numbers with our sum and path to write all the numbers into the file. If we get back an error, then we'll just do nothing. And then finally, to finish off the function here, we can just return OK with a unit type inside of it. Now finally, just so that we can see the values in our application, I'm going to print out the vector, and then I'm going to print out the sum. Now let's go into our numbers.txt file and put in some numbers. So I'm just going to add some random numbers in here, and then as we run our application, we should then add more and more numbers to this file. So as you can see here, we run cargo run, we get all of the numbers that were in the file in a vector, and then we get back the sum, and then when we run cargo run again, we get all of the numbers that were in the file with the new sum appended to it, and then we get a new sum. And we could continue doing this, and you can notice that the sum will continue to increase and so our application works as we described it because of the tests that we set up and the way that we implemented everything. All right, guys, 
I know this was a bit of a basic tutorial on tests. Eventually, I want to show you guys a project that I've been working on called Tari, and I want to get into some of the more real world tests that I'm doing over there. Honestly though, they're not that much more complicated than the tests that we wrote in this application. Because if you write your code properly, then most of your functions will be very simple and you'll be able to test each individually and then you can build larger functions by composing these functions together. If you enjoyed this tutorial, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike this video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. If you want to support the channel, go ahead and hit Patreon and go ahead and ring that notification bell. Have a good night.